from the programme that uh, I have been allocated five minutes. Uh, this is entirely fair uh, because I was not the best attender of the group um, because the meetings were always in the early evening, which is actually peak time for the director of an institution because that's when your council meets and you have external speakers, etc. Uh, I hope you agree that this has been a valuable exercise and I certainly do, although I participated only in part of it, uh, because I have been struck by one unusual feature, I think, of this financial crisis. Because it seems to me that normally when there is a disaster, whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, as this one has been, at the outset there is a highly diverse set of explanations offered, uh, ranging from some plausible ones to conspiracy theories that you find these days in the blogosphere. And then gradually, as more is learned about the events, we begin to home in on a central narrative about what happened. It strikes me that this financial crisis has put that process into reverse, in that we began in 2007 thinking that this was really about the subprime issue in the United States. That was the centre of the description. Uh, but now we are well away from that, and there has been an extraordinary proliferation of explanations for the crisis, some more plausible uh, than others. Richard was kind enough to refer to the book on central banking that uh, David Green and I have just produced, but I also have amused myself recently uh, in parallel with this exercise in producing a kind of taxonomy of explanations for the crisis, which actually will come out uh, at, on the 30th of this month, called the financial crisis, who's to blame? And in that, I parse the explanations into 38 separate explanations. And Richard, if you could give me a, I, I could do, if I just did five minutes on each of them, would that be, um, <laughs> would that be acceptable? Um, but most of them, fortunately, uh, are included in various ways in this uh, text. But I do think it is still extremely important to think clearly through what problems we are trying to resolve. And I have a huge amount of sympathy uh, with what uh, Charles was saying uh, about uh, solutions not closely related uh, to the problems. And we can see uh, at the moment big decisions being made, whether in Basel or indeed here and in the US on regulatory reform, which seem to me to be quite loosely related to any plausible explanation as to why this crisis occurred. Just on regulatory reform in the UK, uh, for the second time in 13 years, we are reforming our regulatory system in a fundamental way, and essentially using the same methodology this time uh, as was done last time. Uh, this is the methodology known as load, fire, aim. Um, and last time I was the person who was charged with doing the aiming and this time I'm delighted uh, that it's Adair and Andy Haldane and others uh, who are doing the aiming uh, because I think it is not at all clear uh, to which problem, to which version of the problem the new regulatory structure envisaged uh, is a solution. So I hope that this tome and the various contributions in it, some of which you've heard about already and more of which you'll hear about this afternoon, uh, is not too late to influence policy. Uh, I think particularly I would point to uh, Sushil's view about the way in which monetary policy, macro policy, if you like, needs to be integrated with macroprudential policy and indeed conceivably with direct controls. I think we are at serious risk of setting up a system which, as he vividly described, uh, could pull in different directions against each other, which I think would be most unfortunate. So I hope that even though it's now almost the third anniversary of the crisis, which I think many people date to the 9th of August 2007, uh, with the first liquidity crunch, I still think this is extremely important to think clearly through what the problems are and how to resolve them. So I should end um, 
by expressing my gratitude on behalf of the LSE, but I hope also on your behalf to uh, Richard for leading this exercise. Uh, Richard is, in my view, the perfect professor. He is provocative, he is productive, uh, he is engaged with the real world, and he is unpaid. Um, <laughs> because, of course, uh, he did formally retire uh, a little while ago. Um, and thanks also to uh, Paul Woolley, who is also the perfect donor and supporter to an academic institution, because not only uh, does he provide serious financial support, he also does most of the work himself. Um, so they are both uh, my favourite people in this area, uh, and I thank them uh, on your behalf for leading this project. But I think that probably takes us to lunch. It's not the end. There's more interesting stuff in the afternoon. No,